My name is Jen Benedet. I'm the R3 coordinator and R3 works to bring Californians closer to hunting, fishing, foraging, and the shooting sport. Uh, we work to get you outdoors and to build that confidence. So these harvest huddle hours are meant for you to be able to connect with experts, to ask questions and get all of your questions and, and concerns handled before you take time to go out into the field. Um, so we're so glad you could join us today. Um, we're gonna be talking about waterfowl calling and decoys. And we have a super knowledgeable panelist for us, uh, for you today. Uh, but I, before we get started, I just wanna remind everyone that these sessions are recorded. I realize they're at lunchtime. So if you need to jump off, you can always visit the wildlife.ca.gov backslash R3 webpage to find the recording library for these events. Um, someone will also be able to answer your questions in the chat box today. So if you go ahead and look at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, if you're on a smart device, uh, you should be able to tap the screen and see the Q&A um, icon or the chat box. For the chat box, you're gonna use that to talk to me and the people behind the scenes. For questions to our panelists, you're gonna use the Q&A bubble to go ahead and submit your questions. And at the end of the presentation, we'll work to answer those things. And if you have any trouble figuring that out, you can chat with me and I'll try to help you out along the way in the background. So today we're going to be talking about ducks and maybe geese. Geese too, Jeff, or just ducks? Primarily just duck calling. Duck. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to go ahead and introduce you to our presenter, Jeff Smith. He is with California Waterfowl Association. He is the hunting and education program supervisor. His experience includes so much in different programs with CWA. He's been there since 2008, working on programs like the Hunt Program, Becoming an Outdoor Woman, which is also known as BOW, Veterans Hunt Program, Camp Sprig, the UC Davis College Camp, the New Zealand Hunter Exchange, Hunter Development, and other programs for K through 12 education. He also happens to manage CWA's Butte Creek, Butte Creek Island Ranch and Sanborn Slough, which is all in the Butte Sink and makes up about, I don't know, 380 acres, 70 acres, something like that. It's a lot, a lot of land. So he's super knowledgeable and he's gonna walk us through uh, how to get started with calling. Um, again, don't forget about the chat box. Don't forget about the Q&A box. Uh, we wanna interact with you. So please let us know you're there. All right, Jeff, go ahead, take it away. All right, perfect, thanks, Jim. Yeah, so today we're gonna to be going over duck calling and decoys. So I'm gonna put on a video here in a little bit and it's really meant for you to actually use your calls during the presentation and go through it. So the calls that I'll be using is just a regular single read duck call and a wing setter whistle. If you happen to have a whistle that might look like this, it has the hole in the bottom of it, um, when I use it for the pintail, the only thing that you would do differently than what I'm doing on the video is you're gonna put your finger in the hole just like that for the pintail. All the other whistling duck sounds, you're just gonna hold the call just like this and you'll be able to mimic um, all the same sounds that I am doing on the video. But uh, basically I've been uh, hunting since I was a little kid, tailing, tailing around with my dad and my brother um, the most fascinating part of waterfowl hunting for me, uh, besides, you know, spending time with family, dogs, etc., is actually the art of calling waterfowl. So um, just kind of always intrigued me as a little kid and then continued to do it and have made my own calls, etc., just messing around. So I think it's a really neat component of waterfowl hunting. I'm going to be able to kind of share some of those real easy techniques to get you started into duck hunting. It's a long process to get to you know where you sound like ducks, but um, I think a lot of people, if you just spend time with it and really spend some time um, out of your weekly schedule and just practice a little bit, you're really going to see some improvements. It's usually not the time to start practicing, you know, just only during you know a hunting scenario. You need to practice at home, outside before you go out in the marsh. So um, with that being said, grab your duck calls and your whistle. I'm gonna put on a video, it's gonna be around 17 minutes. And then after the video is done, I'm gonna go into decoys. And when we talk about decoys, we're gonna be talking about field decoys, floating decoys and motion decoys. We're not necessarily gonna go into how you set them up, but if you have questions, I will answer that. 
but um, get your calls ready and we're gonna watch this video. Hi, so we're gonna be going over just the basics of duck calling today. We're gonna learn how to blow a mallard hen call and a whistle. So our whistle is gonna mimic the drakes or the males of widgeon, mallard, pintail, teal. And this one is a mallard hen call. Now, gadwall, widgeon, they'll also quack. It's just a different pitch of a sound on the quacking, but you can make it with this call as well. Okay, so first we have two different types of calls. We have what we call a double reed call. And it's simply just two pieces of mylar that make up the reed or a single reed call, which is just one reed, okay? So, duck calls. This one is a wood and a polycarbonate. It's gonna range from 15 to 25 bucks. You might have a custom handmade wood call, might range from 50 to $150. And what I blow with is a combination. You have wood and acrylic or all acrylic. Totally depends on what your budget is. I would recommend any beginner just buying a 15 to $25 call, learning that, and then progressively getting a call that you like and you're comfortable with. Okay, so we have our duck call. In my instance, I'm gonna blow a single reed call. So the difference between single reed and double reed is really just the sound. So a double reed is going to be kind of in the middle range where a single reed can kind of do it all. It can go really, really soft or really, really loud. I would recommend, again, a double reed call for beginners. Okay, so we have our duck call. I'm gonna pull mine apart so we, so we can see the components. Okay, and the one that you could see through, that's the barrel, and you're gonna put those on your lips. This one is the insert, okay? So you have a wedge block, you got your reed, you got your tone channel, and you're just gonna insert that back into the barrel so you have your duck call. Okay, so now what hand do we hold the, the call with? In my case, I always hold it with my right hand and that's because I hold the forearm on my shotgun with my left hand in the duck blind. So when I'm calling, I could drop my call, grab my gun and shoot, okay? So just personal preference. So what we're gonna do first is you're going to put your palm out, all right? And right here in the valley, you're gonna put your insert and you're gonna make an okay sign that you should got it. Now you're gonna take these three fingers, you're gonna put them together and you're gonna come down towards your palm. You're not gonna to touch your palm, but basically you're gonna have kind of the diameter of a quarter, let's say, up uh, towards the bottom of your insert there. So come down, okay? And now you're gonna put the call to your lips. And it's as simple as, you know, drinking a bottle of water. So bottom lip, top lip, drink that water. It is really important that your lips are not blocking the hole to the call, because you're gonna be forcing air in there, um, so you don't want your lip to be in the middle of it. So you want bottom lip, top lip, okay? So we have our okay sign down on our insert, come down with your fingers, bottom lip, top lip, okay? Now, where do we get that air presentation that we're going to force into the duck call, okay? and that air is going to come up from your diaphragm. So what I want you to do is just grab your hand, I want you to blow on it. And now I want you to act like your hand's a mirror and try to fog that mirror up. You'll tell the difference. The first presentation of air is just kind of cold. The second presentation of air when it's that hot air coming up from your diaphragm, <laughs> that's hot air, okay? Just like if you're playing football and you say, hut, hut, hut. That same air coming up through our diaphragm is the same air that we're gonna force through our duck call, okay? So you'll see a lot of videos online, YouTube, cassettes, DVDs, or whatnot, that teach you to put a word into the call. It might be hut, quit, twit, whatever it may be. I think that confuses people when they're trying to say the word into the call and it messes up their rhythm. 
So what I like to teach is just getting the tip of your tongue, okay, and you're gonna bury it where your gums and your teeth meet on your bottom set, okay? So you're gonna bury it just like that. And what happens is your tongue rolls up, okay? So on the back of our tongue, that hot air is going to come up and we're going to cut it off from the roof of our mouth, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna turn my duck call around and I'm gonna blow my hot air into it with the tip of my tongue buried where my gums and my teeth meet, okay? And I'm gonna make this sound. I'm gonna puck up my cheek, my um, lips, okay? Cause you don't wanna, your cheeks like this. So out here, and you're gonna make this sound. Okay, again, tongue's buried, air coming up over the back of your tongue and you're coming up towards the roof of your mouth and cutting it off. Okay, so I come back, got my hand position right, my okay sign. Okay, and really important, when you start pushing air out of that duck call, your three fingers on the end need to come out, okay? So think of this as a tunnel. These three fingers are feathers and every time air comes out of that tunnel, you're gonna push those feathers out. What I see a lot of beginners do, they'll blow the call and come back and then you can hear it. It's gonna really cut that sound off. So I'm going to get my okay sign, come down, Bottom lip, top lip, get that big breath of air. Up, I'm gonna force it through my diaphragm. Okay, ready? And all I'm doing is, fingers are going out. Okay, and what happens with a lot of beginners is those fingers will come the, the other way. They'll get sucked in, and this is what it would sound like. So make sure that you have a gap right here, and when you blow that air out, your fingers are going out with it. Okay, so what I just did was a single note. Quack. Everything is built on that quack. And now we're going to build up to what we call a five note cadence, okay? So right now you would take in a deep breath of air and you're gonna go three notes right on top of each other. And to get the rhythm, you're gonna think three blind mice, three blind mice, Three blind mice. So on the back of my call, it's gonna sound like this. Three blind mice, three blind mice. So here is my three note cadence. Okay, from there I'm gonna build up to what we call our five note cadence. So now it's three blind mice, one, two, Three blind mice, one, two. In the back of my call. Okay, three blind mice, one, two, five notes. We're gonna take in a big breath of air, hot air coming up through our diaphragm. Our tongue is still anchored the whole entire time. So that is our five note cadence of a hen mallard, okay? Now what we're going to do is what we call a feed chatter. So this is the only time that I'll teach people that you could actually say something. So you can either say tit, 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 and your tongue is actually kind of coming to the roof of your mouth on the back of your front teeth. So one, it's gonna be our, feeding call that's more of a, a cluck, 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 and then we're gonna do what we call a rolling feed chatter. 
So this is what I mean by our clucks. I'm saying the same thing in the call. All I'm doing is moving my hand to make the sound a little bit different. The other one's gonna be what we call it rolling feed chatter. So you can either say ticket, 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 or do go, do go, do go, do go, do go, do go, do go. Here's ticket, ticket. Do go, do go, do go. It's the same exact sound, it's just whatever your personal preference is. Okay, so what we've learned so far, we've learned two different types of calls, single read and double read. We've also learned how to push air into the call up through our diaphragm. We've learned our hand, okay sign on our insert, coming down, bottom lip, top lip. Our feathers are going out when the wind's going out, okay? And we've learned a quack, a three note cadence, a five note cadence and a, a feed call, okay? So, single quack, <coughs> three note cadence, <coughs> five note cadence, <coughs> okay, and then our feed call. You got your clucks. <coughs> you got your rolling feed. <coughs> Okay, so when you're out hunting, you can put all those together and really sound like a bunch of ducks. So you might be out in a hunting situation, sitting there in the wetland. be something kind of more in a, in a hunting situation but those are the basics to blowing a duck call okay do not ever blow a call in a car when you're driving terrible acoustics what I recommend is turning the call around blowing through the insert and really practice on that kind of muscle memory going to be a lot better off than trying to find the sound that you want in your car. So terrible acoustics do not actually blow sound in your car, okay? I see a lot of people doing that and then when they get outside in a hunting situation, um, they're not used to that sound, okay? So that's the basics on duck calling in itself. Now we're going to go into our whistling ducks, okay? So we have our Drake Widgeon, Drake Pintail, Drake Mallard. These are the some of the, the calls that we're going to learn about. And still, it's, it's that hot air coming up from your diaphragm, okay? So what I have is a wing setter call. They were invented here in, in California. The company is still here. I think it's one of the better sounding uh, whistles that you can buy, $25. And there's two different holes on my call, okay? So I'm going to do a Drake Widgeon first. And on the whistling ducks, you are going to say some words in the call. So a Widgeon, you're going to say, wee, 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 wee. And you're going to really emphasize the W's, okay? So I'm going to take my index finger, and I'm going to plug up my left hole. I'm going to take my hand and kind of press it over my call. So it's going to um, really emphasize the different sounds of the widget okay so index finger over my hole wee 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 okay in a, in a hunting situation you wouldn't just keep doing the wee 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 over and over you would kind of just do little Wee wee wee. Stop for a little bit and then keep going. So, in California, we're kind of at the end of the flyway. So, 
most ducks have heard people blowing on a mallard hen call for a long time, okay? So your best bet to learn and master is a whistle, and it's going to really help you out in the field. So we just learned a widgeon. Now we're gonna learn our pintail. So what I do is I cover the right hole on it, and you're going to flutter your tongue if you can't flutter your tongue, just like if you're going to gargle, you're gonna use the back of your throat, and you're just gonna go little spurts. Okay, and it's gonna sound like this. Again, if you can't flutter your tongue and you can't make that gargling sound, like if your mouth is full of water and you're gargling at the end of the night, they do make other calls where there's a little piece of a wood dowel or a straw that makes that um, fluttering sound for you. So again, you would just basically be peeping in it. It's going to do that for you, okay? So that is our pintail call. And now what we're gonna do is our Mal Drake Mallard call. And you're gonna put your teeth together. You're tip of your tongue is going to be in the middle of where your, your teeth meet and you're going to make the sound zzzz. you're going to say zoot zoot and you should really feel your your tongue vibrating on your teeth and this is what a drake mallard sounds like The other common one um, that you're gonna hear is a drake teal, okay? And I think there's two different ways to do it. There's one, it's a, it's a rolling teal call. It sounds very similar to a pintail. You cover the left side of your call. Okay, so you just do the same thing as the pintail, but you're just gonna cover the left hole, or you can just go zoot, zoot. Okay, and that's what a green wing teal is going to sound like. So again, this is just very basic duck calling. It does take a long time to master. I would highly recommend you buying a whistle first, mastering that, and then kind of move on to the duck call. But for, for me, um, duck calling is an amazing part of waterfowling. So if you have any questions, please bring it up in this webinar. And now we're gonna go into decoys. All right, and what types of decoys do you use? When and where? We're gonna go over just a standard floating decoy, field decoys, and motion decoys. So first, we have our floating decoys, okay? So regular duck decoy, these are gonna float in the water. They all usually have a, a weighted keel or what they call a water keel. So a weighted keel, you throw it out in the water, no matter how it lands, and it's gonna, right itself. If you have a water keel, you necessarily just have to set them in the water, then the keel will fill up with water and you're good to go. Um, if you're walking a long distance, usually you'd want a water keel just so you're not carrying around a ton of extra weight. So on each decoy, you're gonna have some type of a clip here on the keel to keep it in the water. So here's your decoy line. And then you have you know, a piece of lead or whatnot to keep it in the water. So as you can see, this one's only about a foot and a half, two feet long to stay in the water. I also have a loop here. So this is called a Texas rig. So you can get a carabiner and, and carry a bunch of these. And it's just a great, easy way to get decoys in and out of the field. They don't tangle up as much. Um, so you'd see these like in big spreads or you know at the refuges or whatnot. So that's a floating decoy. Again, you're gonna have Ducks and geese come in floating decoys. So here's another one, a little bit different. So this one's got flocked head, looks a little bit more realistic. But this one I use in our, our river spread. So as you can see, there's a ton of line just wrapped around the keel. So when you're done hunting, you wrap it around. Okay, but there's you know probably 15 feet of line on this decoy. If you're hunting at public waterfowl or wildlife areas, you only need about two feet of line on, on your decoys here. 
Again, you're gonna have a piece of lead, but that's just another version of a floating duck decoy. Um, if you're pursuing specific species of ducks, you know, that's the type of decoys that you'd want. Um, most people will use a lot of mallard duck decoys, and that's not necessarily what you wanna be doing if you're primarily hunting or shooting widgeon, teal, pintail. They have different colors. So if that's primarily what you're shooting, let's say spoonies, buy those types of decoys. You wouldn't want to hunt a refuge with two dozen mallard decoys if that's a bird that you just don't harvest. Or, okay, so, so get the decoys that match the species that you are harvesting. Okay, so next are field decoys. Primarily field decoys are going to be to shoot geese. Um, there are scenarios where you do shoot ducks in dry fields. Also, people will use full body duck decoys to put on their um, rice spread, et cetera. So there's a couple different types. So one is going to be what we call a, a silhouette, okay? You could pack a bunch of these, all right? But this is just a silhouette staked decoy. You just push it in the ground. You could carry, you know, 10 dozen in a bag, so they're really light. Um, and how you set these out, it was kind of spaced out, you know, three to eight feet away from each other. And it just gets that illusion that they are actually looked like, you know, live geese. So these can work great in scenarios. A lot of the times when people are putting these out, they make the mistake by bunching them up, okay? Just because they want it to look like a, a lot more geese around each other. Um, actually, if you spread them out, it looks a lot more realistic. The next one is going to be what we call a sock decoy, okay? They come in specks, honkers, snows, etc. A lot of people use them for snows, okay? It's not a great looking decoy. When it is windy, these socks really fill up with wind and they really start bouncing up there. And with a decoy like this, you're going to want quantity, okay? You're talking over 300 decoys like this to get you that more of a realistic look. When you just have, you know, a dozen of these on a, on a check, you know, with no wind, they just don't look very realistic. So with wind duck, with wind decoys, you're just gonna want a lot of them. And again, it's primarily, a lot of people use these for hunting snow geese. We have big numbers, you have spreads of 2000, 3000 decoys primarily softs and they they're effective they're absolutely effective but you got to have some wind okay next what we have is a full body decoy okay super realistic okay i've had a lot of success just hunting over you know a dozen to 18 um full body decoys I mean, in 18, not in a dozen, just actually 18 decoys, okay? Looks like a nice, good family group. If they're realistic, super important. So you'd have a stake that would come up through the body, and then, you know, in the wind and whatnot, it can move back and forth. But um, depending on your budget, you know, all of these range from as cheap as, you know, 100 bucks a dozen all the way to, you know, 210 bucks per six. But let's say you're in a, a refuge hunting scenario, and you want to, you know, to be kind of light, you can go three or four full body spec decoys and, you know, a dozen variety of duck decoys and you can be successful out on a refuge. You just kind of got to get away from people and do something different. And I think the way to do something different from most other folks is motion decoys. So if you see ducks on the water, they're constantly moving. Okay. And that's, what's really important. I think that's what, um, Kind of separate some people's success and i'm a huge proponent of having motion decoys so there's two different types there would be some like a jerk string that i'll show you here in a second um, spinning wing decoys and those are legal depending on the time of the year and then uh, just regular you know water churning decoys so one of my favorites is just the what we call a pulsator butt okay so it's just got a pump at the bottom of it you're going to turn it on. It's going to spray water up here and it's going to look like the ducks going back and forth, back and forth in a feeding motion. And this really creates a nice wake in your pond or in your field to get the ducks attentions. Again, ducks are constantly moving. So when you're out hunting and there's no wind, no nothing on a sunny day and your pond is glass and that's not really what ducks do. Okay. 
Another one would be a, a kicker. So this is just gonna kick up the water again. It kind of comes up pretty high. Um, work great, legal all year. Same with the pulsator, that is legal all year. Okay, so a common name for any spinning wing decoy, depending on the brand, everyone just calls them a mojo, but this is actually the mojo brand, but there's a number of different companies that sell it. But usually when people talk about spinning duck decoys, they just refer it to as a mojo. So this is a mojo duck decoy, spinning wings. Okay, so you're gonna have a battery, it's gonna spin this, it's gonna look like a duck's landing. All right, that's what happens. These are only legal after December 1st. So look at your regs and know that, all right? Um, you could use as many as you want when they are open, but do know that prior to that, you can only have wing powered decoys that have a spinning wing, okay? So in my opinion, um, we use what we call a blade. It's just one big long piece of aluminum that spins. Um, these are these work great on on young birds, but you know once everyone turns them on and you're in an area of a refuge and the whole entire pond has one of these, I would scrap it and go to something else just because the the ducks get really uh, groomed to them and they're just not that effective. Okay, I really like using two. This is just a wonder duck. Okay, again, all all season this this is legal. This is gonna spin around and flash water up. Again, you're gonna want a, that mimic of birds moving around. So you can have one of these per you know, 12 decoys or whatever, and it really looks really look realistic. When we talk about wing, wing powered, okay? So you could use this, it's called a wing, wing whacker. I mean, literally these things blow in like one to two mile an hour wind. And it just looks like a duck landing again. And these are legal all season. So especially early on, you know, we'll, we'll run a couple of these at a time on a windy day and they really get birds' attentions. In a higher wind scenario, I'm talking about over 15 miles an hour, these really start to bang around and start to make a lot of noise. So just be cautious of that. If they're really making a lot of the noise, you know, a lot of the times the ducks will get scared by that. But Again, super cheap and inexpensive to buy uh, a wing whacker and you can use them all season. And they're really easy to pack. This just goes into a conduit post and you're ready to roll. Okay. Last but not least, every waterfowler should have one in their bag. It's just called a jerk, jerk cord. Okay, so you typically would have a, a weight, a bungee line, and then a regular cord with clips on it. So you could just literally clip it onto your decoys that you brought in your bag. And all you're gonna do back this is just pull the line back and forth, back and forth to get movement on the water, okay? And again, even with the jerk cord, it's kind of like calling ducks. You know, do it on the corners and pull it. You know, when they're coming right at you and you're pulling the jerk cord and then they'll see it and it's not as effective again. If they're on the corners, the duck's going away and you hit them with like a comeback call, and you pull that sucker, a lot of the times they'll, they'll really catch their eye and then come back towards you. So um, that is kind of it on just the beginner stuff on, on duck calls and decoys, okay? So with setting decoys, I'm not gonna go really into it, but just, you know, for the most part, you want the wind at your back and you want the, the sun in their face, not your face. So depending on that, and it doesn't always, um, it, it doesn't always happen that way. But when you're in a hunting situation, just know where your sun's at, okay? Ducks are going to always land into the wind and you've got to have a great hide um, to be successful. Usually, you know, I prefer a sunny day with a small breeze, you know, eight to 10 miles an hour, I think to me, that's the ideal hunting situation with kind of a cold front coming on or it's kind of crisp in the air. A lot of people here you know, love a storm day, which is great, but usually storm, you have clouds, okay? When it's cloudy, the ducks can really see well, okay? So it makes it very hard to duck hunt when on a cloudy day, in my opinion. Goose hunting on a cloudy day is extremely hard because it can really pick apart of where your blind is and pe where people are hunting, so. 
that's kind of an overview of you know waterfowling with calls and um, basics on the decoys. So if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to, to share them. Great, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone's patience with the technical difficulties that we've experienced today. <laughs> um, I, I think the live presentation was great, actually. Um, we may have to record you doing some of those calls to splice them in um, for some of the audio uh, next week or something. But anyway, we'll figure that out. Um, some of you have been pretty chatty in the chat box. I appreciate that. But I want to remind everyone that there's a Q&A bubble icon located at the bottom middle of your screen that says q a it looks like two little speech bubbles if you go ahead and click on that and submit your questions through that for jeff we can go ahead and open it up to a live q a i've taken some notes from the chat in the chat box um, and we have some other questions already to kick us off so i think we'll just go ahead and get right into it so let me pull up the list okay so we have someone so you went over some, a lot of this stuff but we have someone who is asking for techniques and laying out decoy patterns um you kind of talked about decoy amounts and type species etc um yep. but do you want to touch a little bit on on the patterns and maybe flight zone and things like that yeah yeah so i mean let's say that the, the wind is at your back and you want to shoot a duck that's that's coming into your face you know that's what most people want to do. So you'd want to leave a hole of some sort in front of you, you know, and it could be from 20 to 35 yards out in front of you. Um, what I like to do is, you know, I like to keep kind of my species with each other. So if there's pintail, you know, put the pintail out by each other, put the mallards out by each other, you know, they, they will inter intermingle if you have a big spread, but you know, sometimes if people just throwing them out randomly. You got, you know, a, five pack over here, mallard, widgeon, teal, et cetera, out by themselves. And, and they really don't do that. So if you have, you know, I would say less than 30 decoys, really kind of position them nice next to each other. Just do kind of family groups. But what a lot of people will do is like a, a J hook. So basically you would have, it looks like a J. So let's say you have the small part of the J on your left side and just a big tail come off from your right. And then there'd be a landing zone basically in the middle where the void is. So that's kind of it. Great. Um, oh, this is a good question. Uh, I feel like I feel like this should be posted on every refuge info board. How do you know if you're calling too much, too loud, or not loud enough? <laughs> yeah, good, good, good question. I mean, short answer, the, the ducks will tell you. Um, not every duck is callable what you'll look at is their body language. So if, they're, if their head's going back and forth and they, they're tipping their wings when you're calling at them, rule of thought, if a duck's in a straight line in a V, that thing's headed somewhere, okay? So it needs to be flying around looking, but the ducks will tell you, they're either gonna flare or what we call not finishing where they work a lot and they just don't get in that range where you want. And that's where it's just time in the field, it's just, trying to read ducks. And that's where, you know, your practice should happen prior, but when you're out in the hunting situation, you just have to read the birds, but it all depends. Some ducks don't want to hear a call very loud and some ducks you can literally scream at them until, you know, you pull the trigger. So it just, depending on the situation, rule of thumb, if it's windy out, blow your call as loud as you want. If it's not, if it's calm, don't blow as loud. What about, um, do you want to talk, this is not a question that someone asked, yeah. but you talking is inspiring me to ask you this because I think it's good information. Um, what about when you're in a, an area with other duck hunters who are also calling, how yeah. do you figure out when you can complement their calls or when, whether or not you're competing with them um, for everyone to be successful? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, you want to honor the other hunters. So if you were being nice to each other, you know, if the duck is working their spread, you know, you're, you're not calling, but let's say the duck comes off and is headed in a separate direction and might be 150 yards headed south towards them. And that might be where you're at. Then you could go ahead and call. But let's say if you're all in a pond and there's three groups and every group is calling at it, you know, no one's really working together. So that's one of those things where you would like to work together with folks. But I mean, I've had people where 
you have a bird in your decoy and they're 500 yards away and they're still screaming at it on a duck call, you know, and that's just not being very sportsmanlike. Right. And on that same note, um, how have you handled people who are skyscraping? Um, so for those of you that don't know that term, it's people taking shots when what you're shooting at is clearly higher than you're going to, yeah. to hit. So what, I mean, do you have etiquette uh, advice around those types yeah. of communal I mean, duck hunting practices and places? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, with that being said, it's very hard to judge a distance from a distance, right? So what I've learned with just watching our hunters over the years is a lot of people just aren't good shots. And I'm sorry to say that, but there might be a, a bird at 25 yards and they haven't been, you know, successfully shooting that shot all day, but the bird's in range, right? So at a distance, it might look a lot further, but unless you're in the blind, you really don't know. Now, the other side of the coin is when you're at a refuge and people are skyscraping geese that are in a V at a hundred yards flying through, you know, that that's too high and they're just crippling birds and not shooting them. That's a totally different subject. And there, you know, don't involve yourself and get in another hunter's face or whatnot. I, I would not do that. It just kind of ruins everyone's day. But if there's a person, you know, crippling birds and they're sailing and, and killing a lot of birds that they're not going and getting, you know, a game warden should be called and then the game warden could go deal with it and figure that out because, you know, that's a one waste issue. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, so here's some other questions. Can you use any type of call and decoy anywhere or are there rules about it? So I think there maybe this person's asking because yeah. you know there's electronic calls for other species. Maybe yeah, that's a great I'm question. So yeah, so on duck calling, you can only use you know hand calls. You know, you cannot get a recording on a phone and, and blast it through a speaker. In some other states during, a, you know, what they call a conservation season, you can use some electronic calling. In Canada, there's times where you also can do that primarily when you're hunting geese. But let's say for California's sake, you know, there's no time that you can use electronic calling. So it's all got to be, you know, coming out of your own mouth in the calls that you're holding. But in terms of the number of calls that you can have, you know, you could carry 100 duck calls if you wanted to No. Um, stipulation on that and the decoys other than the spinning wing motorized powered by a motor that's the only one where there's a stipulation on it and that's after december one but everything else if it doesn't have a spinning wing on it is legal thanks um we have a question that just came in what it what's the furthest oh this is asking how far out should your furthest decoy be to help gauge the distance of a successful shot or possibility of a successful shot? Yeah, I mean, it's all, everyone's different, right? So, but I would say most people, their maximum effective range is probably 35 yards. Um, I wouldn't put your last decoy there. What I would do, however, is, is find one decoy. It might be this Drake Sprig is going to be at 35 yards. And I know if a duck is over that Drake Sprig, that's it, it's in range. So for me, I, I've literally put decoys, you know, 800 yards away from me at a, in a rice blind scenario and, and kind of done like a fake spread almost. Um, so decoys can be super far away from you. When you have 2,500 decoys in a rice pond, they got to be spread out. So um, either, you know, put a stake out there or a, one decoy in particular that you know okay, that's my effective range. That's 35 yards and I could shoot a duck over that. And what a lot of people don't do is, is actually bring a range finder out hunting, like just like you would deer hunting. So you're ranging a chili patch. Okay. That's, that's 40 yards. That's a little too far for me. Okay. This is a 38, et cetera. It helps out a ton. Um, cause people, you know, typically say, all right, I think that chili patch is 40 yards. What well, happens to be 75. So get a range finder. It really helps out. As an archer, I, I will confirm that that is excellent <laughs> advice and also confirm that most people that I hunt with who are shotgunners don't do that. So, I mean, yeah, it's great advice. Plus, it really does help you judge distance. Even, you know, the more you use a rangefinder, the more you're 
you know, the better you get at just judging distance yourself to know whether or not you should or shouldn't be taking a shot in the sky. And yep. I think that's also, you know, um, a really useful skill to have. Um, how do you, how do you clean your decoys? Yeah, great, great question. Um, usually, you know, cheap way, uh, Dawn dish soap in a, in a brush. Um, there's actually a great product here out of uh, California. It's called Filthy Fowl. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to promote anyone, but it is the easiest thing I've ever seen. You like literally spray it on your decoys and it dissolves all the organics built on it. And you wash it with the hose. It's the most simple thing ever. Hmm. Um, so we do that with all of our program decoys. It just takes all the leg work out of it. We used to literally scrub them down and we'd have to repaint it. I mean, it'd take days. And this literally takes, you know, maybe an hour to do thousands. So it's amazing. But Dawn dish soap and a brush if you want to go the, the hard route. Okay, we got a, quite a few questions still and we're one minute to the end. So yeah. I'm going to do rapid fire. So rapid fire round, okay? Yeah. Are ducks smart enough to know that a canvas back decoy is fake if there aren't canvas backs in the area? Uh, no, but I would say um, having something different is good. So canvas back decoys got a bunch of white on it, real bright and noticeable. I know guys that you know never have shot a canvas back and will put one or two of those in their refuge spread just as an attention getter. So, yep. Does flocking decoys make a difference? I think it does. It depends on how pressured your ducks are. It gives it a different look than everything else. So if you have a flocked head duck decoy that looks really nice, you know, sometimes paint gets a little bit dull. So to me, these, it's just a contrast. They look pretty good on the water. Again, you're gonna wanna clean it up and whatnot, but flocking fades and when it fades, you know, get rid of them or whatever. There's been a few comments and questions about uh, your jewelry. Um, people want to know what is on your necklace. Um, the uh, you know, and so maybe talk about the bands and how to report and yeah. how you attach them to a lanyard. I don't know. All right. Doing. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> you know, these are these are bands that have harvested over the years. Um, ducks will have it on their legs, scientific purposes to figure out where they're going after they're banded, how old they are, etc. So within CWA's programs, I mean, we've had, you know, mallard ducks that have been over their 20s and been shot in a lot of different flyways, Canada, Louisiana, et cetera. So those are ducks that are banded here in California. So that's really the science behind it. Um, but yeah, to get them off the duck, I mean, literally cut the foot off then just get some pliers, put it inside of the, the duck band, pull out and then squeeze it back on without getting your you know marks of the pliers all over it. So and make sure I think it's really it. cool. Yeah, report your duck band. So report a lot it. of people will say, oh, I'm not gonna report it because you know, if all the ducks are getting shot, then you know we won't have a duck season. It, it'd kind of be the opposite approach, right? So if, if a bunch of ducks that, if the, they were all harvested, all the ducks that would say, all right, well, we could actually probably shoot more ducks because these ducks are getting shot. It's just all about numbers, but usually like, you know, I think it's like three to 5% of them are, are actually getting reported. So that, that's what they think are actually getting shot. So wow. some of them will have a uh, money reward on it and those will typically get reported at a higher rate. So then they could kind of take the rate between a normal band and that reward band and kind of find the true number too. Um, also is, does CWA still doing their duck banding program? Um, because I think it's really cool, especially if you have kids. So if you're all still doing it, I'll give you a plug. Um, so the, the banding program actually allows people to come out and band ducks themselves and actually put the band number on. You record the band number. And then usually, depending on who's doing it, you all go down with your ducks and you let them go. And then maybe in a year or three years or five years or, you know, wherever, uh, someone else will shoot that duck at some point and report that band number, which is pretty cool. Um, so yep. you should participate in it. Um, if you guys still got it going on, I think it's a really cool experience for kids, especially. Yeah, we're, we'll, we're still doing that. You know, look at uh, May, June of next year, we go to the hatchery and, and ban them and, and release them that way. Um, we do also have some opportunities where people can actually go out with our crew and find nests or, you know, what they're doing right now is, is rocket netting pintail uh, preseason. So they're already over 1500 pintail over the last month. So it's been going pretty good, but um yeah that's awesome well thanks jeff so much our time is up together if you didn't get your questions answered and i know we didn't get to all of them 
Uh, please remember you can always find resources on the statewide R3 page, or you can email us at R3 statewide program at wildlife.ca.gov, and one of our R3 team members will answer you or push your email to someone who can answer you. Uh, please join us for the next R3H3 session on October 15th. Um, it is about navigating your first trip to the archery store, what to look for, what should you consider, how to test out bows, understanding draw length. Um, and then on October 29th, we're going to do an introduction to teaching kids and families how to fish. Um, again, as always, those events are free and virtual, and you can register, uh, find the registration link up on the R3 calendar on the same R3 page. Um, thank you so much for your time today. This wouldn't be possible without all our huddlers and for our presenters. Um, Jeff, it was a pleasure having you, and good luck to everyone for waterfowl season this year. Let's hope for water. Um, thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you.